Good evening, everyone. If you could um, let me know that you're hearing me. If you just want to take a quick type into the chat and let me know if you can hear the audio. Great. Good. And then Melissa, are you out there too somewhere? Yes, I am. Great. Excellent. Excellent. Um, we'll get started because it's time to start. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, it's, it's good to gather with you again on Zoom. I hope you're all doing well tonight. Um, I'm Cindy Harn, and I serve as the Executive Director for the Nature Foundation of Will County. And I have the pleasure of hosting tonight. I'd like to welcome you to our seminar, Healthy Yards, Replacing the Invasive Woody Plants in Your Landscape with Native Species. Before I introduce tonight's presenter, I would just like to take a moment to thank all of you, our donors and our business partners for your continued support. If you have questions tonight, just type them into the chat and we'll try to get to all your questions if we have um, the time. This presentation is being recorded and we will uh, have it available on our website tomorrow. If you just wanna sit back and listen and not take notes and then watch it again, that would be great. Um, or if there's something you wanna um, you know, just run through again after the session, it's always nice to have those videos to um, take a look and refresh your memory. Um, this is our last virtual seminar this year, but we do expect to be back uh, at it again next spring. So that'll be, uh, we're looking forward to that again. Um, our presenter tonight is Melissa Kustik, who is the Chicago Region Trees Initiative Specialist named as the Millennial to Watch by the Illinois Landscape Contractors Association, Melissa manages projects developed by a multi-agency work group charged with looking at the key issues facing trees and also building a healthier, more diverse regional forest. Melissa holds a master's degree in plant biology and conservation from Northwestern University and has a decade of experience in research, education, and outreach. Melissa, we are so thrilled to have you here tonight to talk about trees and what we do about invasive woody plants. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My pleasure to be here. Um, let me just get this up and going. Sure. All right, so I am Melissa with the Chicago Region Trees Initiative. Um, and I'm really excited to join you all tonight. Um, and Cindy did a really great intro, so I'm just gonna jump right into it actually. Uh, and with just a small bit of background, because I couldn't really present without explaining what the Chicago Region Trees Initiative is. Um, so really, we're not an organization. Um, I'm housed at the Morton Arboretum, but the Chicago Region Trees Initiative is a partnership. So there's more than 200 organizations that are all working towards this same goal that the trees in the seven county region will be healthier, more abundant, more diverse, more equitably distributed. Um, and really we're a bunch of tree huggers, but ultimately it comes down to improving the quality of life for the people who live in the seven county region. And you know, it'd be okay if outside the seven county region lives are improved by more trees as well. All right, so the plan for tonight, um, I'm going to touch a little bit on why why your yards in particular matter. Um, and then I'll zoom into the why and how to remove specific invasive species. Um, and then I'll talk about once those are out, what are some great tree and shrub placements. Um, and because a lot of trees and shrubs get planted, but not a lot of trees make it to their mature size, I'm also gonna do a little bit about how to take care of the trees, the right way to plant them, the right way to take care of them just because we wanna make sure that the trees get to the big size where they provide the most benefits. So the value of your land. Um, first, it's important to note that uh, every county runs what is called LIDAR, where they fly an airplane back and forth over the county and they shoot lasers down to the ground. And the speed at which the laser bounces back up is read by a sensor and that gives us an idea of what is on the ground. So we've been able to make use of that data to come up with one of the layers we use frequently, which is, which is our land cover mapping. 
It's how we figure out where the trees are in the region so that we know which areas need more canopy cover um, and which ones are doing okay. And even within one community, maybe the north side of town has lots of trees, but the south side of town needs more trees. It's one way that we can just see exactly where they are. There's high resolution data. Um, and just, this is an interesting map because it shows you side by side. This is on the left, the satellite imagery. And this is on the right, what it looks like when we have the analyzed LIDAR data. So pretty quickly, it's clear. These things that are have really straight edges um, are taller than things around them. The computer can tell us right away that those are buildings. And you can see from the satellite photo, that's pretty accurate. Um, you can see this area that is brown is bare dirt, bare soil. And that's again, based on this image, pretty accurate. Um, the things that are black are the roads. The things that are gray is what we call other paved. So things like parking lots, sidewalks, and again, matches pretty clearly. And then these big green patches, the dark green patches, those are the trees. So the computer can automatically look over the LiDAR data and see things that are taller and kind of fluffy shaped and it can code them as trees. So what that means is that we can look at the whole seven county region and get an idea of areas <clears throat> that have high canopy cover and areas that have low canopy cover. And this is pretty granular in this image, but you should be aware that we have this data at a high resolution. I think um, the latest round is being analyzed right now, and that is something like a two foot resolution for those who are into mapping. All right, so in this map, dark blue means lots of tree cover, and the yellowish color means very low tree cover. So there's some pretty quick things to pick up here. One is that the further away from Chicago you get, the lower the canopy cover is. And so um, the obvious thing to point out here and that you're probably all thinking is that that's a lot of agriculture, that's a lot of farmland. And we are not suggesting that we replace corn and soybeans with trees, although if they want to, that'd be great too. Um, but just maybe that there's a place for trees there along the riparian corridors or in windbreaks. The other patches of yellow you see tend to be the historically under-resourced areas or places that have a lot of industry. Um, so that tends to be where we end up prioritizing more, but there's a lot of interesting things going on in Will County. So um, hopefully this is our chance to tackle some of that. And namely one of, those, one of the interesting things is that across the region, most trees and most plantable area is on private property. And in Will County, you guys have typically bigger properties, bigger yards, more opportunities to plant trees, but also more opportunities um, to house some of the problem species that maybe we can change, you know, remove the invasives and put in something more exciting, more valuable, something that you'll get better use out of. And we'll talk more about that as we keep going. All right, so it's not just can be covered. It's not just getting more trees planted and more trees taken care of but also thinking about our keystone species. In the Chicago region um, and really across the Midwest, oaks are really important to the natural history of our land. So this is a map of where oak ecosystems, that could be oak savannas, um, oak woodlands, upland woods that have oaks as the dominant species, any of these oak ecosystems, this is where they were prior to European settlement in the 1830s. This is where they were as of 2010. So I'm gonna do another back and forth on this. That's the 1830s. This is 2010. We're down to the last 17% of the oak ecosystems that we had uh, just a couple hundred years ago. So why do we care? I, yes, we used to have a lot of oaks. They were more widespread, but why does it matter? Well, there's a lot of wildlife that's dependent on oaks and the companion species that are associated with these ecosystems. Um, this is just a small sampling of wildlife that is um, dependent specifically on oak trees. And a study by Doug Ptolemy found that there are 534 species of caterpillars, Lepidoptera, that depend on oaks. So um, this is caterpillars, those turn into pollinators, the moths and butterflies but those are also food for birds, especially migrating birds. And there's uh, a couple of critical pathways, migration pathways that come through the Chicago region. Uh, so oaks are important. And if we want to keep all the wildlife that is native to this area and critical to this area, we need to make sure that we have 
the plants, especially trees, that they are dependent on. And we need to make sure that they can get from one patch of oaks to another patch of oaks, which is what this fun map is all about. So not only are we down to the last 17% of our oak ecosystems that we had a couple hundred years ago, um, but those ecosystems are more spread out and they are disconnected. They're what we call fragmented because there's just fragments of remnant oak populations spread around. And because a lot of wildlife is dependent on it, but also needs to be able to stay within these areas, we need to come up with a way to create corridors of oaks and those companion species to support this. So yes, the things like the birds and the um, butterflies and moths, but also things that don't have wings. There's a lot of um, herps, a lot of amphibians and lizards and snakes and things that depend on these same ecosystems. So if we can create corridors, we can help them uh, stay connected and have enough habitat to support their populations. So if you go to our website, chicagorti.org slash oakmap, um, it's an interactive map and the key, the legend is right here. So these blue areas, you'll see them kind of dotted around. Those are what we call the core oak ecosystems. So these are remnant properties that are, uh, I don't remember the minimum size, but these are the larger properties that have oaks on them. Um, and then there's purplish, bluish lines connecting them. Um, and those are proposed corridors. So they don't currently exist, but they could exist. Let me zoom in a little bit. So it looks something like this. You can see these blue patches of these oak ecosystems are remnants with a little bit of buffer around them in gray. And these are the proposed corridors that go through them. So zooming in one more level, let's say um, you live somewhere around here and I apologize, this is not Will County, but it makes a good image. Um, let's say there's a residential neighborhood here or even a downtown area somewhere. We're not asking people to knock down their houses and put up a forest, but what you could do is plant an oak tree in your backyard or um, get your neighbors to plant oaks and hickories and the other companion species that go in. Even if you don't have a very big yard, you might have room for something like a hazelnut, you know, something on a smaller scale. And it'll still support connecting these oak ecosystems for those wildlife that depend on them. Um, so definitely do go and play with this map. It's a lot of fun. ChicagoRTI.org slash oakmap. All right, so your land is important. Most trees are on private property. Most plantable area is on private property. And these corridors very likely run through your neighborhoods. <laughs> so um, check the map, see if your home is there, and maybe you can be a part of supporting the wildlife that needs you. But let's say you're right on a corridor or right adjacent to one of those core areas. Um, and you're like, that's fantastic. But you go out and you look at your yard and you're a little bit nervous about some of the plants that are back there. Um, well, first, here's, here's what you should be worried about. Um, this is the Forest Service's definition of invasive species, and I like it because I think it covers a lot of the different angles. So first of all, an invasive species is non-native to the ecosystem under consideration. So I sometimes hear about um, things like common goldenrod being a problem. That's a native species to this area, but it's aggressive. So if you have a small yard, maybe you're not gonna plant that particular goldenrod, but it's not invasive, it's just aggressive. Um, so an invasive species has to be non-native to our area. And then the second half is whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. So it's not from this area and it already does or could potentially cause a lot of harm. And there's a lot of different ways it can cause harm. Um, so two of the big ones we're gonna talk about, actually I can just go to the next slide to show you, um, buckthorn, which you already see highlighted in red, um, and honeysuckle, which we'll talk about more in a second. So this fascinating pie chart is based on a tree census that was just done um, and just finished being analyzed this past spring. So every 10 years, we work with the Forest Service to do what we call the tree census. We go out to 200 plots across the region and we just look at what species are there, what trees, anything bigger than one inch diameter. Um, so what trees are there, how many trees are there, what species. Um, I think we look at things like condition and what's on the ground cover, you know, turf versus mulch versus concrete. And it gives us an idea of what's happening across the region. So more like it's a sampling to get an idea. Well, when we did this in 2010, 
Buckthorn made up 28% of the trees across the region. So we knew we had a big problem and it's something we've been working on. But when we did it in 2020, just got these results, it turns out Buckthorn is now 36% of all the trees in the region. So it's even more of a concern. And this is really something um, because buckthorn is more prevalent on private property than public property. If you see it in your yard, please get rid of it because it's spreading rapidly. If it's not in your yard, but you see your neighbors, if there's a friendly way for you to talk to them about it, that would be amazing. Um, these are other species in the top 10 list, the top 10 most common trees in the Chicago region. You'll see a honeysuckle is on there twice. Um, if it just says honeysuckle species, it means that the people who were doing the survey weren't totally sure which type of honeysuckle it was. They knew it was an invasive honeysuckle. So 6% of all the trees in the region are honeysuckle. We've also got some white mulberry and some European alder, both of which are known to be, uh, depends on the list you're looking at, either invasive or aggressive. So we have some problems. All right, so looking specifically at buckthorn, because it makes up 36% of the trees in the region, um, we were able to break it down by county. So I don't think I've put in a thing here, but you can find Will County here. Compared to Lake County, it's not a huge problem in Will County, right? You guys are doing a whole lot better than that. But 14% of all your trees are buckthorn. That is still something to be concerned about, especially since it's higher than it was when we did the census in 2010. So it's growing. Um, and you have the good fortune to not be in Lake County shoes with 52% of your trees as buckthorn. This means it's maybe, it's a big problem, but still small enough that maybe you guys can get a handle on it um, and stop it from spreading further. Of course, it's never as simple as that. That's not the only invasive woody plant out there. So I've highlighted Will County, but this is, um, oh, I don't know if I didn't update the date there. I believe this is from the 2020 census because this was looking at the change. Um, what percentage of all the trees, and this is in this, Column, what percentage of all the trees in Will County um, are these particular invasive woody species? So 3% of your trees are autumn olive, 12% of your trees are honeysuckle, and you'll see that's quite a bit higher than in the other counties. Um, so as much as you have to worry about buckthorn, you also need to be particularly worried about honeysuckle. Uh, let's see, 3% of your trees are white mulberry, there's buckthorn again, and then 7% of your trees are black locust. So these are invasive woodies that are growing rapidly, but that also have a pretty significant presence already in Will County. Um, and just to, just to point out, there are some more woody invasives. Um, anything that you see here with this lighter green color means that it grew from the last time. So these are the numbers from the 2010 census. These are the numbers from the 2020 census. And this is how much they changed from last time. So Across the region, Russian olive, the population has grown. Privet, the population has grown. Honeysuckle, the population has grown majorly. Calorie pear, uh, the populations have grown. And in case some of you um, have calorie pear that you planted or there's some planted in your neighborhood, some of this is because people are buying them and planting them, but a lot of it is because they're escaping out into natural areas, which is becoming a bigger and bigger problem for those land managers. Um, and buckthorn, of course, has grown also. So um, when you're out in your yards, when you're out hiking, just keep an eye out for these invasives. Um, this is a good time to start tackling these where they haven't been worked on before. Okay, so how do you know if you have buckthorn? Um, I will give you some images to look for. So there's actually two species that we talk about most often when we say buckthorn. It's common buckthorn and glossy buckthorn. <clears throat> All the traits I'm about to describe are common to both of them, even though they're different genera, um, but the information is still consistent. So in both cases, they are either understory shrubs or small trees. They can get to 25 feet tall though, so they can get pretty big. Um, often they have multiple stems. And this last word on the slide here, dioecious, um, this is important, so I do wanna explain it because it comes up later. Dioecious is just Latin for two houses. It means that there are male plants and female house, sorry, female plants. So um, if you see a buckthorn that has the berries on it, that's the female. And 
about this time of year, if you see the a plant that doesn't have the berries on it, that's just the male. So they're, they're housed in different plants. All right, some more ID tips. The leaves are kind of egg-shaped, but with a tip. They tend to have glossier leaves and they start green, um, finely toothed. So on the edges of the leaves, you can see it's just lightly serrated. Um, and you'll see about three to five pairs of veins. This one is one of those indicators that always helps me identify it, if I'm not totally sure. If you know about branching, um, so let's say this is the stem of a plant. Uh, if leaves come out right opposite from each other, that means it's opposite. We call that opposite branching. Otherwise, sometimes it comes here and then here and then here and then here. That's called alternate, sort of alternates where those nodes are on the branch. With buckthorn, it's almost opposite. They're not quite aligned. It's like they're even and then just off a little bit. So you can see here, what would be straight across, there's a node there and a node slightly down. There's a node here and there's a node slightly down. So it's sub-opposite. They're very close. And it is called buckthorn. Um, and what is referred to as a thorn is this point at the end of branches. It's not technically a thorn, um, but it is very sharp. So walking through a thicket of buckthorn could get you hurt. All right, some descriptors. Um, if you're trying to identify by bark, it's maybe not the best way to do it. It is very different between the younger buckthorn and the older buckthorn. When it's young, it's smooth, it's gray, and there's a lot of lenticels, which I'll show you the picture in a second. As it gets older, it starts to exfoliate more and have curling uh, peels. But if you're pretty sure it's buckthorn, one of the surefire ways is to just scrape off, or if you have a nice sharp knife, just peel off some of the outer bark and look on the inside because it tends to have a vibrant yellow sapwood and a vibrant orange heartwood. So here's some pictures of the bark. You can see the small one is much smoother, shinier, and all those little white bits are the lenticels. And then it gets more peely as it gets older. And here's the inside. So you can see if you, if you scrape back from the bark, that orange color is usually strong enough to identify it. Um, depending on the time of the season, here are some other indicators. The flowers are nothing special. You may not notice them at all, even if they're in your yard. It's kind of a yellow green color. Um, the berries do stand out though. So they're dark purple to a dark um, blue or black. And there's copious amounts of them, like in this picture. Um, and those are right between August and September. So you can start seeing them right now. If you look out your window and you've got something you're worried about, you can see them. All right, so moving on to Amr Honeysuckle. This one is unfortunately very pretty, so it makes it a little harder to pull out. Um, or when it's in bloom in spring, that could be a great time to start pulling it all out because then your neighbors will be like, what are you doing? You're pulling out that gorgeous plant. And that's your chance to say, this gorgeous plant is a big troublemaker um, and maybe get them on board. Anyway, so the leaves, uh, we talked about branch arrangement just a second ago. The leaves are opposite. So they come off the branch at the same spot on opposite sides. Uh, the leaves are like an inch to three inches long, so not terribly big. The flowers can be white or yellow, sometimes like a pinkish color, but they are uh, nested right in the bases of the leaves. So you can see that they're sort of paired right off the branch, right in the axles of the leaves. Um, those flowers will be there May to June. And then you can see, because you have the flowers like that, right at the base of the leaves, you're gonna have the fruit there, right at the base of the leaves as well. Um, but that comes more, I think, around September. One of those indicators, again, if you have that sharp knife on you, um, always good to have a pocket knife with you. If you cut the stems, the inside of honeysuckle looks hollow. Right in the pith, it's just, it looks like it's a hollow stem. So that's one of those giveaways. Um, and there's the picture of the fruit again. OK, so why do we care? Maybe you've looked out your window and you see there's just a ton of buckthorn or a ton of honeysuckle or maybe both. And it looks overwhelming. You're like, well, maybe it's not a good deal. Maybe I'll leave it there. Well, um, hopefully these next several slides convince you otherwise. In, in the cases of both buckthorn and honeysuckle, they tend to get green faster in spring than the other plants around them. And they keep their leaves on longer in the fall. So that means a couple of things. One, it means that their season of growth, when they have leaves out ready to photosynthesize, is much longer than the other plants around them. So they're able to capture more sunlight and convert it to more 
carbohydrates and that just gives them an advantage. Besides that, it's shading out the other plants. So especially when you have things uh, like buckthorn and honeysuckle in an area that is normally full of spring ephemerals, if this is greening out a lot faster, it's shading those out, it's blocking them. So um, not great for the health of that ecosystem if all the plants that are supposed to come up in spring aren't able to survive. Um, sorry, I'll go back for just a second. The one nice thing about this is that it's easier to find these invasives um, when everything else has lost its leaves and these are still green in fall. It's easier to find them to get rid of them. So when you're cleaning out your yard, you can go out in November, even early December, and they may sell leaves and it's easier to identify which ones to get rid of. Okay, so what else are they doing? Well, I mentioned how they can block the other plants. So by doing that over generations, you're reducing the cover and diversity of the native plants that can grow in those areas. Once that seed bank is depleted, it's gonna be really hard to get anything else to come back. Um, there's even some talk, although I don't think it's confirmed, there might be some allelopathic properties of, um, of at least buckthorn, I'm not totally sure about honeysuckle. And allelopathic just means it releases some kind of chemical that prevents other plants from growing around it. All right, Emodin is a big one. This one is specific to buckthorn. It's a chemical that's found in all parts of the buckthorn plant, so the leaves, the twigs, the roots. Um, and it seems that the purpose of Emodin in terms of for buckthorn, the reason it produces this expensive chemical is to deter herbivory. Um, but it causes a lot of other problems in the meantime. So uh, I think I'll talk about this later, but the leaves and stick of, sticks of buckthorn tend to decompose faster. Um, and that means that as the parts of the plant break down and fall to the ground, this chemical emodin that's in those things leaches out into the soil uh, at a pretty consistent pace. And then it gets into the water systems. Um, here we go. So because it's in the water and often at a pretty high level, it's mutating the eggs. Um, I'm trying to think. There's a lot of malformations, even at really low concentrations of um, all the amphibians that have laid eggs in those waterways. So let me just repeat that because I feel like I jumbled it. The emodin comes out of the plant tissue as it decomposes. It gets into the groundwater, it gets into the streams, and then amphibians come and they lay their eggs in those waterways. But even at very low levels, that emodin in the water is causing malformations in these embryos and the eggs that are developing in those waterways. So <laughs> it's not good to have a lot of buckthorn in an area because it's going to be causing problems with our amphibians. All right, so besides releasing that emodin, I mentioned that the leaves decompose faster than other leaves of other plants. They have a higher nitrogen, um, nitrogen to carbon ratio in their leaves and that helps them break down faster. But that means that there isn't that layer of what is called on this slide duff, that humus layer on top of the soil. Um, so it causes problems even for the e ecosystems that are in the soil. You wanna make sure that there's a steady food supply for all those microorganisms in the soil that need that the food to keep breaking down to keep the ecosystem going. Um, and so if you are missing a variety of plants that break down at different speeds, and if you only have buckthorn, there's quickly not that layer there. So besides not providing food for the organisms in the soil, um, oh, lost my train of thought. It also means that we have erosion problems. So see this picture here, it, the soil is breaking down, or sorry, the duff is breaking down too fast to create a new soil level that can stay up there and be consistent. And so it's washing away soil. There's no small plants left there because they've been outcompeted by the buckler and honeysuckle. Um, it's a whole lot of things happening all at once. And then just one good rainstorm comes by and it washes the soil off these roots. And now even some of the taller trees in that area have stability issues. Um, and just keeping going with these problems we have with wildlife <laughs> from buckthorn and honeysuckle. So 
starting with buckthorn. Um, you may see birds, if you have a buckthorn hedge, you may see them in there, but it's not an ideal food source for them. They tend to go there if there aren't other options. And because of that emotive, it's actually also a diuretic. So it causes digestion issues with the birds who then are not getting nutrition from those fruits, but also um, are expending energy releasing it as they go. Um, yeah, that's enough to say on that one. If we're looking more at um, the honeysuckle side of things, what's interesting is that there was a study done, I think it came out just two years ago, that found areas that have big patches of honeysuckle tended to have more ticks. So another problem, um, the impacts of the wildlife are not always negative. Sometimes it supports a population of wildlife. And in this case, it's ticks. We don't want that. Uh, there's enough tick-borne diseases out there that if you're encouraging them with having a big patch of honeysuckle, you're gonna have some problems in your yard. Okay, so buckthorn and honeysuckle are terrible and we wanna get rid of them. How do we do that? Well, if you only have a few or there are just a handful of small ones, there are tools you can use like this one to just sort of pull it out. It uses a lever system, um, not too bad. If you have a ton on your property, this really isn't practical, um, but might be something worth trying. All right, herbicide. So this is probably the most common way to go about this. Um, you can cut down buckthorn, just get you know some sharp saws, even chainsaws and cut them down. But if you only cut them and you don't use herbicide, they will just keep re-sprouting. So uh, hopefully you're all comfortable with using herbicide. And if you're not, it's okay to hire somebody to do this, maybe follow you if you want to do all the cutting. Um, but the good news is the chemicals you use for this, you need to put just where the vascular tissue is. So the vascular tissue is the xylem and phloem. It's what takes the water up and the carbohydrates down and it lives just behind the bark. So on small stems, you can put the herbicide across the whole stem because it would take more time to try to get just on the edges. But on the bigger ones, you don't have to waste herbicide on the whole stump, just put it at the edges. And these are green and blue, not because the herbicide is naturally green or blue, it's because they put a dye in so they can keep track of which trees have gotten the herbicide and where it is. So that's another good tip. And again, if you don't use the herbicide, it's just gonna keep coming back. So if you are serious about getting this out of your yard, and if you're hesitant about herbicide, I will also say that remember all the other downsides to keeping buckthorn in place and honeysuckle in place, things like uh, the emodin causing wildlife problems or the honeysuckle attracting ticks. There are other downsides to not using those herbicides that are impacting the ecosystem. All right, if you do it the right time of year, there are also foliar herbicides you can use. You just have to make sure that you're doing it when these species has leaves and um, the other native species around it do not. And again, always follow directions on any herbicide you use. All right, so what if you have just an overwhelming amount of buckthorn um, and not the funds to hire some company to just take care of it all in one shot? Well, um, I mentioned before that buckthorn at least is dioecious. So it's got male plants and female plants. If you need to start slow, you can at least get the female plants out first or make that the priority. Once you have the females out, you won't have any berries being produced on your hedge of buckthorn, your field of buckthorn. Um, and so that's one way to control the spread of it so that you can then tackle the rest of the buckthorn slowly over time and as you're able. Prescribed fires are another good way, but of course, make sure that you have enough training to do the prescribed fires. Um, there's a lot of technique involved and there are trainings available across the region um, or hire somebody who's done it before. You want professionals doing this. And one of the plus sides is that this is the sort of thing that can be done in winter. So as I mentioned, honeysuckle and buckthorn both have their leaves on longer than other plants. So it's easier to see them. You can even flag them while they still have leaves and then just throughout the winter, just keep hacking away at it. Um, one of the nice things about this is that the ground will be compact because it'll be frozen. So you're not worrying about compacting the soil some more. Um, and also 
it'll warm you up very fast. This kind of work is a bit labor intensive. It'll heat you up. And even if you're still a little bit chilly at the end, you're gonna end up with a pile of wood that you're gonna need to burn. So, uh, you know, work for an hour or two and then have a nice bonfire, roast the marshmallows. And it's really important that as you're going about getting rid of the invasives on your property or helping your neighbors get rid of theirs, that it's not going to be gone in one season. Even if you spend the entire winter clearing your property, expect for this to be a multi-year process. Um, because if you set your expectations in, you know, clear it all out and it's done, you're gonna be really frustrated when it keeps coming back. The good news is I have heard lots of success stories where if you just go at it every year for about four or five years, it does stop coming back and you can start planting other species to fill in those areas. All right, so your yards are very important and um, the invasives on your yard, in your yards matter. So hopefully you're gonna clear those out now. But once they're gone, um, here's the fun part, you get to put new stuff in. So selecting the trees and shrubs for your yard. Um, we're gonna start on the theoretical side. One of the big things that's important for our region, especially, but even for your neighborhood, is having a variety of species represented. Um, I'm gonna use terms like community forest or urban forest. That's just, trees don't know the boundaries of property owners or municipal boundaries. They're part of an urban forest. They interact with each other, whether it's through their roots or through birds hopping around from tree to tree. Um, the rainwater they catch, they don't stop catching it just because it's on public property versus your yard, right? Trees work together as a forest. And even with the shrubs and with all the perennials and everything else going on, they work together as a forest. Your urban forest, your community forest, will be more resilient if there's a variety of species mixed in. And when I use the term diversity, I'm talking about what we see in community one versus community two. So breaking it down, both community one on the top and community two on the bottom, they both have four species of trees represented, but they don't have the same diversity because the one on the top is an even mix of species A, B, C, and D. So it's 25% of each. So it's a more even mix. Whereas community two, it has those four species, but almost all of the trees are species A. So that's not great diversity. It's the same species richness, the same number of trees, but not the same even mix. And that matters because you see a community like this where they have beautiful tree-lined streets, but most of these trees are ash. And so this was just a summer or two later. And I say summer, you can see in the background that there is a tree here that's fully, fully green uh, with a full canopy. So, so that impact again, here's this block and just a year or two later, the same block. If you plant all the same species on that block, you're going to be more vulnerable to pests and diseases that come by that like one species in particular or one genus in particular. We're also seeing an increase in the frequency and severity of storms from climate change already. So I've heard a few people say, why don't we just pick trees that are from you know, a few hours south of our region and they'll be able to tolerate the warmer temperatures. Well, it's because it's not that simple. We'll have mild winters, <clears throat> excuse me, we've already seen some of those, but they're getting punctuated with ice storms. We are going to have years like this one where there are periods of drought and periods of flooding. What we need, are across regions, across neighborhoods, a variety of trees that can handle all of these different scenarios. So, you know, if we just picked Kentucky coffee tree as a nice hardy tree, let's all plant that one. Well, what happens if there's a condition that it doesn't like? What happens if there's a pest that comes in that likes just that tree? And just going back to the pest and disease for a second, it's not hypothetical when we talk about a pest or disease that likes one species or genus in particular. So this is the most recent one that I'm sure you're all familiar with, the emerald ash borer. In 2010, there were 13 million ash trees in our region. Um, and I don't know exactly how many we lost. We're still waiting for some of those numbers to come back, but I can guarantee we lost most of them. Um, if they're not totally dead, they're at least struggling, not doing well. Um, we had, more maples at that point, we had twice as, more, twice as many maples as we had ash trees. So all it takes is something like this Asian longhorn beetle coming into our region, 
that really likes maples and we're gonna lose a significant number of trees. So this is all to say, when you're choosing new trees or even shrubs or other plants to put in your yard, it's worth taking a couple of walks around your neighborhood and trying to identify what other trees are around and then picking something that isn't very common. So if all of your neighbors have a red bud, don't find a red bud. If all of your neighbors have maple trees, don't plant a maple tree. So that's the don'ts. Don't plant the same things all your neighbors have. So what about the, how do you select? Well, um, base it on the site conditions you have. So the growing conditions, how much sun does that spot get? How wet is the soil? Is it close to a busy road that has a lot of salt? Using these kinds of things can help you narrow down what but what trees you can put in, what shrubs you can put in. Um, also look at the location relative to any buildings or other things around it. So in this picture over here, you can see the row of evergreen trees. Um, that's providing a windbreak. So it's reducing the heating costs of this house in the winter. So there are ways to kind of think strategically about what benefits you wanna get out of your trees. Um, utilities, if you've got power, wire, power lines, um, you know, please plant something that'll, that'll never get bigger than 20 feet tall. And then once you pick out the things you need based on sites and location and utilities, then you get to go into the fun stuff. Do you want native trees? If you have native trees, it'll attract more native wildlife. So, you know, that's a pretty good perk. Um, consider structure and form. So I will say that the trees that grow the fastest also have the shortest lifespan. So if you're gonna plant a tree next to maybe the playset in your backyard, you don't necessarily want the fastest growing tree to go there because you don't want to have to worry about limbs falling. Um, also, trees that tend to have really upright branching are less structurally sound, less, less structurally stable. So those ones don't need to go right next to the patio. <clears throat> Excuse me. I like to use this picture here as an example of that. Calorie pear is known for having really weak limbs. Um, it doesn't even take a major event. Sometimes it's just simply a strong wind can break off their limbs. So if you aren't convinced not to plant a calorie pear just because it's invasive and smells bad, let this be the thing that maybe um, convinces you not to plant calorie pear, or maybe it helps you convince a neighbor not to plant calorie pear. All right, so um, other things you might wanna be looking for, there are a lot of native trees and shrubs that have edible parts. So whether you wanna plant a hazelnut, a service berry, pawpaw, there are a lot of fun options that can bring food into your yard um, as long as you can get them before, you know, the raccoons and the other wildlife. All right, so if you're looking for some suggestions, we have actually a couple of fun brochures out there. There's a few that are part of what we call the healthy brochure series. Um, so these ones are, the one I'm showing you here is healthy hedges. This is if you're pulling out a buckthorn hedge or other kind of invasive hedge. Consider replacing it with rather than one a single species hedge, um, which is not gonna support as many different types of birds and pollinators and whatnot. Consider doing a, a variety of textures and heights and colors just for more interest and for supporting more wildlife. Um, and this you'll see there's quite a few suggestions. <clears throat> I also wanna give credit. These pieces were all produced with help from um, forest preserves and landscape contractors uh, and the forest service. So we had a lot of input from experts from different angles. If you still want more of the traditional hedge shape, there's actually ways to do that and still use native species. So all of these native species can be grown in a line and then pruned to have that hedge shape. So you can still have a formal looking yard and have natives in your yard. So just in case it's hard to read, we do have this online that you can print out or we can send um, the pre-printed ones, um, but I can just read out, there's things like uh, the native honeysuckle, bush honeysuckle, which is Dyervilla lanisera, um, smooth wild rose, red osier dogwood, spice bush, even shingle oak. So if you wanted a taller hedge, normally this is a tree that's 50 to 60 feet tall, but it handles being pruned severely pretty well. So that's sort of an interesting option. 
Um, as part of this series, we also have some other pieces like healthy homes, which is a bigger focus than just replacing a hedge. This is to improve the health and conservation practices overall in your yard. So if you guys already do conservation at home, this is sort of a nice piece that might complement them. And healthy habitats is for those with much larger properties. So it's just management practices over a large scale. This is one side of it, and this is the other. All right, and now's the part where I just suggest some trees um, that are not commonly planted across the region. Um, so the cucumber magnolia, and I apologize, I meant to pull out the ones that are not specifically native to the Chicago region, but I believe it is native to some parts of Illinois. I have to double check that, um, but I'll go fast because that one's not <laughs> region specific. Um, persimmon, this is one that if you wanted to get um, something edible in your yard that is also a native tree, it's not commonly grown, so you don't have to worry about the diversity across the region. Um, it's a medium to large size tree, so it can be between 35 and 60 feet tall. <clears throat> um, it does work in parkways, but it also is great in a backyard. One of the things I like about it is the bark. It's kind of choppy. It has a lot of winter interest there. Um, and yeah, it's great in a lot of conditions. It can do full sun, part sun, um, likes a kind of a medium soil. Sassafras is another one of my favorites. This is a smaller tree. It only gets to about 30 feet tall, but look at that fall color. So if you wanted a medium sized tree with beautiful fall color um, and it smells good, sassafras is a fun one to get. Um, yeah, this one is one interesting that it does like having acidic soil. And there's not a lot of patches of that in the Chicago region. So do some soil testing first and make sure that's one of the things you're considering when you pick a, a species. Similarly, things like birch and pin oak, they like a more acidic soil. <clears throat> All right, so the next couple slides um, are borrowed from Chris Benda. Hopefully you've had a chance to hear him speak. He has, he's very knowledgeable. There's a lot of cool stuff going on, um, but if you're haven't heard from him, um, check out IllinoisBotanizer.com, it's his website. So these are some of the suggestions he suggests, some of the things he suggests um, for swapping out invasives with native choices. <clears throat> so on the left you see calorie pear, flowering pear, ornamental pear, whatever you call it. Um, and if what you're really looking for is some kind of pretty white spring flower, you can get that from things like hawthorn or um, American plum um, or there's quite a few dogwoods actually that have this pretty spring flower. And guess what? These ones all support native pollinators. Um, this is one that I am enthused about because burning bush is one of those growing invaders that's taking over. You find it in all the forest preserves, but it's still commonly sold and planted across the region because of this. I mean, you see how, how vibrant that color is. It, it is beautiful, I'll give it that. But there are natives that also have beautiful fall color. For example, this hazelnut, Corlys americana. I mean, that's really stunning. And if you had a row of those, it's still a gorgeous hedge. All right, if what you're looking for is just a generally a deciduous hedge, um, a lot of people have rows of lilac. Um, and I'm guessing there's, I'm hearing there's even a trend of Japanese tree lilac. So lilac, is not on any invasive species list that I'm aware of. Um, Japanese tree lilac, however, there are some concerns. So not on any list yet, but I have heard from some land managers that it doesn't stay put. So there's some concerns there. So rather than putting either of those in the ground, or even you know if you're just sick of that terrible lilac smell, I know that is a controversial stance on lilacs. Um, here are some other deciduous shrubs that can do the job. Um, so Lindera benzoin, that's spice bush. So it also has just a really nice fragrant smell um, and some nice yellow fall color. Um, Viburnum lentago, I should have looked it up. I think that one's black hawk. Again, just a really nice structure and you get some pretty white flowers out of it. This one, um, boxwoods are not doing well in the region anyway. Landscape companies are all having problems with it. Nurseries are selling them with the caveat that you can't return them and there's no guarantee on them. 
And really they're not native to our area. They don't provide a whole lot of value, but what people like them for is that you can create kind of a short hedge. It's more of a way to signify the edges of things, make things clean. But if you want just a short hedge, um, you can get that same thing out of, uh, so wild current, wild currents. So you can see here, it's got sort of a nice frothy shape. It stays fairly low and you get edible food out of it. Who doesn't like some currants? You can make some jam out of that. All right, so um, once you've decided what you want in your garden, I did want to point out that there's some resources out there. GardenIllinois.com just came out with this website earlier this year. <clears throat> you put in the species that you're looking for and it'll tell you which garden centers and which nurseries carry them. So um, a good way to find a local business to support. And of course, there are native plant sales every spring and every fall across the region. And it looks like there's one going on now or about to start. Um, uh, right next door. And I, I'm pretty sure you'll be hearing about that before we all sign off for the night. So go ahead and support those local organizations while also getting native plants for your yard. <clears throat> okay, so you've selected some shrubs, you've selected some trees, you've even you've purchased them, they're in your yard ready to go in. Um, let's just make sure that we're spending time planting them right. So one of the challenges in our region is that the trees that are planted are not making it to maturity. So that's having a whole lot of other problems. Um, you know, it's harder for us to increase the canopy cover. It's harder for us to get those benefits from the tree, like clean water, clean air, uh, reduced heat island. So we want to make sure we're spending time planting it right so that it becomes a mature tree and has that chance. So just going over the quick basics here. Um, once the tree is in the ground and you're filling it in, you should be able to see the place where the tree trunk flares out into the roots. So we call this the root flare. You can see where it gets wider. That should be visible above the ground. When you're digging the hole, the best way to do this is to make it at least twice as wide as this root ball, so the package of the roots. If you see any circling roots, correct them at the beginning. Cut them if you have to, or just straighten them out if you can. Dig out any extra soil so that before you put it in the ground, you can find where it flares out into the roots. The ideal version of this is that you see the roots going off sort of like an old wagon wheel where they go out from the tree. Once the tree is in the ground, you can add the soil. You can tuck the plant in uh, by stepping on the soil on the edges, but not on the root ball itself. And then end it with two to three inches of mulch over the top. But once you mulch it, pull it off the tree. So just remember that you're mulching the soil, you're not mulching the tree. And why mulch? It does a lot of things. Um, so mulch can kind of mimic some of the conditions in a woodland or a forest where there's branches and bark and twigs and things like that on the ground decomposing. You're reintroducing some of that woody material that is important for building soils, but also for supporting the ecosystems underground. So you're supporting those microorganisms by providing food for them. Um, those microorganisms that are eating the wood and breaking it down are then releasing waste products. Um, as living organisms do. Uh, and that waste product is a little bit acidic. And so it's helping to get the pH of the soil um, into a more moderate range, which actually helps trees absorb nutrients. So that's an important one. Mulch is also holding the moisture into the soil. So you're keeping some of the rainwater there. So it's not just evaporating right out. Um, and it helps with temperature regulation. So we know about trees going dormant, but interesting fact is the above ground tissues that go dormant and roots don't go dormant in winter. So it helps to have that insulating layer, keeping the temperature of the soil um, from getting too cold. So mulch is important as long as you, sorry, I'm gonna go back for a second because I didn't talk about this image and this image is important. This was taken from a study that was done, I think it was like 15, 20 years ago now. They did soil cores where they take a tube and they stick it in the ground under trees um, and they were doing it in places where there was mulch and they were doing it in areas where there was turf grass. And you can see how much more roots they found in those areas under the mulch. So even if all of these things I'm saying happen when you put mulch down aren't convincing you, this is a pretty good imagery to show that there's more root growth, which leads to happier, healthier trees in places where there's mulch, at least as compared to turf grass. 
And all these benefits of mulch are really only true if you're mulching correctly. These are pictures of mulch not done correctly. So just remember you're mulching the soil, you're not mulching the tree. You should never see it touching the bark. You should never see it touching the trunk. It should be on the ground two to three inches deep and then pulled away from the trunk. Because when you have situations like this, those tree roots will do things like this. They'll start to circle around. So tree roots aren't thinking, oh, I'm a root, I stay in the ground. They're not thinking anything, they're just roots. So they move towards areas where it's easy to grow and where they get water and nutrients. Well, guess what? If you have a pile of mulch above the ground, um, it's easier to push through than soil, especially if you have really compacted or really clay soils. And uh, if the mulch gets wet, maybe you water the tree right there at the base, or maybe just the rain is holding it in. Plus it's still breaking down even above ground. So those roots are gonna keep going just around the trunk and around the trunk. Causes a lot of major issues. Um, so here's the young version. These roots are still correctable. You could prune them, you could straighten them. But on a tree this size, it looks like there was mulch all the way up and somebody pulled it back and then this was revealed. So at this size, the tree can't get bigger than those circling roots. Trees may seem like they're big and strong, but they can't push out past those roots. And we call these girdling roots. Um, and if you remember when I was talking about the herbicide going on the edge, that's where the vascular tissue is, the stuff that brings water up and carbohydrates down. Um, that vascular tissue is basically getting, uh, for lack of a better word, choked by those roots. So water can't go up, nutrients can't go down. And when you see a root like this, you end up seeing a really flat side to that trunk because it can't grow any wider. But you'll also see the branches above that area start to die off. So even if this wasn't going all the way around, if it was just crossing one area, that side of your tree is not gonna be doing well. Um, and if you have trees like this, call in a certified arborist who is TRAC qualified, that's T-R-A-Q, Tree Risk Assessment Qualification. Um, you're gonna want a professional to look at it because this might not be correctable. And if it is, you want somebody who can tell you the risks and help you make decisions. <clears throat> All right, I am quickly running out of time. So um, just here are some useful graphics as reminders. Here's a reminder about the mulch. Um, remember just two to three inches deep around the tree, not touching the trunk. And new trees have a better chance of surviving to maturity and being healthier overall if they are really sort of babied their first three years, we call it the establishment period. So especially in those first couple of years, you may have to water them weekly, spread the water out so it's not always in one spot. You don't have to water them at the base because you want those roots to go out wide. Roots will go as wide um, as they are able. Um, after the first three years, you can keep watering them weekly if it's a really dry season or during a drought. Um, but really what you wanna do is just dig down a few inches if the soil is dry down there, go ahead and add some water. And if you wanted to go ahead and walk around your neighborhood and if you see a neighbor who's got their mulch up the tree or a tree that just looks desperately thirsty, um, we have these door hangers that we're happy to send out in big bundles. <clears throat> it's English on one side, Spanish on the other, and all it covers is mulching and watering. Um, and you can see there's room here so that if you wanted to leave contact information, maybe you know, the HOA contact information. Maybe it's, um, it, maybe you run your municipality or you're the public works director, go ahead and put your contact info there and you can share it with neighbors. And finally, these last two slides are just some inspiration. If your yard is already clear of invasives, you've already filled in beautiful natives, um, I encourage you to reach out to your neighbors and try to help them out with theirs, or perhaps get some volunteers together and do, um, like this, the Battle of the Brush Pile, where they got two high schools to compete with each other and they cleared the invasives around their schools and saw who could get the biggest brush pile. So it's fun, it gets people out um, and it helps clear invasives. There's also other ways to go about it. There's a Buckthorn Fine Arts Festival that's held sometimes, I don't think it's near us, but they get wood turners and woodworkers to create beautiful pieces out of the buckthorn wood they get people to do a chili cook-off. So there's, you know, fun things to taste, good warm food in the middle of winter. Um, <clears throat> oh, this is July, it should be winter. Um, and at the same time, you can get stewards out there clearing areas. So you can make it a fun event. Um, so if you're motivated, but don't have enough to do on your own property, try to find a way to engage the public with it. Cause we're really counting on the people around the region to, to take hold of this idea um, and help us clear the invasives. 
So I am going to stop there and uh, hopefully I didn't take too much time, but I'm happy to take questions at this point. Um, hi, Melissa, thank you so much. Um, I think, wow, um, your information <laughs> and data, it just really shows how essential it is that us as homeowners, um, we take some, some really uh, important steps to try and support our, you know, our native ecosystems. I think um, it's really critical. Um, we do have a couple questions and they both relate to mulch. Um, so we've got um, people wondering about the dyed mulch. Is that bad for the soil? Um, you know, and then there's always free mulch. <laughs> there's bagged mulch. So what are some of your thoughts about the best types of mulch to kind of mimic that natural forest floor? What are, what are the best things to use? Um, so I'm gonna give my answers on this, but know that this is not, there's a lot of opinions out there um, in the world of our culture on how to do this. What you should be aiming for is just an untreated wood mulch. Um, and if you have pine trees, using a pine mulch is better. If you have uh, deciduous trees, just a general wood mulch is fine. I shy away from the dyed mulches because it means that they've been processed with some things and they're, they, I don't have data to support this, but they seem like they break down slower. And when the point is to encourage um, the soil ecosystems, you want something that's gonna decompose and feed that. So I stay away from those. But if you're choosing between like a dyed red mulch and a rubber mulch or gravel, you know, even dyed, that wood mulch is going to be infinitely better. Um, or if it's turf versus that, you know, if that's the only thing your garden center has, I would still go with the dyed mulch. <clears throat> so I guess it's more of um, what you want to get out of it. <laughs> um, yeah, I would prefer not to dyed mulch, but it's not the end of the world if that's your best option. Or honestly, it's your yard. So if you just love the look of the red mulch, go for it. It's still gonna provide some benefits. Um, one of the um, messages that we've been continually reemphasizing is that idea of leave the leaves, leave the stalks, leave the, you know, the stems, the flower heads. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and why you know, in an oak, um, oak ecosystem, why that is so important. Absolutely. Um, sorry, there's a lot to say about that. So <laughs> um, first of all, thinking about just when we're supporting native gardens, what we're really trying to do is mimic um, the functionality of a native, of a natural area. So if you have leaves falling, you want them to stay in place um, and to decompose because first of all, there's going to be pollinators overwintering in that leaf litter. And there's going to be a lot of bees depend on those broken stems as support and birds will come and need, um, you know, maybe your neighbor sees unsightly perennials left up over winter, but that's shelter, that's a place to rest for the birds, that's seed heads. Um, so wildlife doesn't just disappear in winter. Some of it, you know, sleeps or migrates. Um, but there's enough happening that's still there that you want to support. So leaving that in place. Um, but for me, the leaf litter, at least, a lot of it comes down to the soil. Um, you're clearing away that duff layer. You're clearing away what's going to create that new layer of soil. And sort of interestingly, um, the kind of leaf litter you have depends on the kind of trees you have. And, you know, that makes sense. But that also changes the pH of the soil. It changes how fast the leaves decompose. There are different fungi, um, mycorrhizal fungi in particular, that are associated with different types of trees. So when you're leaving those in place, you're supporting the things that have adapted to be with those trees. So yes, you can rake away your leaves in the fall and then pay for leaf mulch to come in in the spring, but you're not getting the same kinds of leaves. So you're already being provided with this useful resource that I would leave in place. Great. Um, Another question is about um, if you're planting the younger trees and shrubs, you recommended, you know, for a couple of years babying them. Um, what about pruning and trimming? Should you be a little reserved with the pruning because they don't have a lot of leaf surface and they need all that sunlight, you know, exposure to sunlight to, to generate that energy? Um, or is pruning okay? What do you think? 
Another good one. Um, and so this is another one that you will probably hear a couple of different perspectives on, but I think there's a pretty good consensus at this point. You should not prune when you plant, um, unless there's a broken branch because you don't want that tearing. Um, quick aside, trees don't heal from wounds, they just seal over them. So if your choice is to cut a branch that's broken so it has a small wound versus letting it dangle and then peeling back and leaving a bigger open wound, um, definitely trim it. Um, but yeah, trees are really stressed by being transplanted. So you don't want to prune branches because photosynthesis is gonna be one of the ways they can um, recuperate, you know, get back um, what they lost. And also it depends on if you're planting a containerized tree versus a bald and burlap tree, to get a bald and burlap tree, they have trees that are grown out of field and they have machines to sort of dig them out and they lose a lot of their root mass. So um, they're gonna need to be able to photosynthesize to regrow all that. They need, basically that's just getting the carbohydrates. They absorb the carbohydrates, they turn it into roots. So you want them to have lots of leaves. But after those first couple of years, you do want to prune your small trees strategically um, because that's going to inform the shape as they get bigger. And you don't wanna leave things like competing leaders. So basically once a tree gets big, if there's two main trunks that are about the same size, um, it makes it less stable. Uh, it's less structurally sound. So yes, when they're young, you wanna prune them, but not that first year. Great. Um, I don't see any more questions. Um, so with that, um, with the, oh, wait, hold on. Um, is there any reason not to move or plant volunteer oaks in my yard to other locations? So that's really a good question. When you do have those uh, natives, especially oaks, just popping up on their own, um, is that a good strategy to spread them? Um, that's a good question. So oaks are tricky. They don't transplant well. Um, so if it's if it has popped up on its own and it's in a place where it'd be okay to have a tree, I would leave it because it's found a spot where it's doing well. Um, it has decided, you know, there's probably acorns all over your yard and this is the one that's surviving. It's probably a good spot for a tree, but if it's two feet off of your house, you don't want an oak tree there. Um, so if you don't have to move it, don't. Otherwise you can try to move it, but expect a really low survival rate. Um, and that's because oaks and, a lot of related species, because I think it's the true hickories as well. Um, well. Hold on, I'm gonna bio, dial back a second. For most of the trees that grow in our, around our region, almost all of their roots are in the top 18 inches of soil. They do not go very deep. They go really wide, kind of like a wine glass. You know, for balance, you want them wide, but they don't go very deep, there's no taproot. Um, but as part of just uh, the anatomy of young oaks and young hickories, they do have a taproot for just the first couple of years. And it does go, you know, not super deep, but a couple of feet. And that means that when you're digging it up to move it, you're almost inevitably going to lose part of that root and cause a lot of stress to the tree. And so it doesn't transplant well. Um, so one thing I will say is that if you are going to try to move it, try to dig it up in spring. Nurseries have found that if they're selling bald and burlaps, bald and burlapped oak trees, they always dig them in the spring and recommend that you plant them uh, in the spring just so that it's less stress on the tree. Um, although generally planting trees in fall is actually also great. But in case of oaks, they say to dig them in the spring. So you'll have a better shot if you do them. I hope that wasn't too much rambling, but <laughs> you can try it, but just, it may not go well. No, I, I've tried moving them and it, it's not a very easy thing to do. Really low survival rate, yeah. Um, we have a comment saying the lecture was fantastic, and she's going to recommend it to her friends and family members, and everyone should see this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, for those of you that are in the Will County area and near Joliet, we still have our October native plant, our native tree and shrub sale. We have... Um, We've sold almost 250 trees and shrubs and we are almost sold out. So we do have some oaks left and a couple other, I think we've got uh, two species of dogwood. So a lot of the things are, you know, those, those key species that everybody wants are already gone. <laughs> they went right away. So, um, so if you do still need to place an order and you want to add an oak tree and help us 
get a little bit better than 17% of, <laughs> of oak ecosystems, let's up that number. Um, it's, it's a good time to plant an oak. Um, so thank you so much, Melissa, again, for everyone. This session has been recorded. It will be up on our website tomorrow. So you can take a look through it again, since there was a lot of data and amazing information um, and charts and website links. So um, you can take a look at it with a cup of coffee and jot down some notes. So thank you again so much, Melissa. I appreciate um, your time tonight and sharing your amazing expertise and knowledge. Thank you. My pleasure. Have a great night. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone.